The Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, GAP, welcomes you to the History of Psychiatry video series. At the dawn of the 20th century, treatment for serious mental illness took place in large asylums, often away from population centers. Custodial care predominated over therapy. Decades later, institutional care had been replaced by outpatient treatment and a variety of community-based services. Today's psychiatric residents will have little or no experience with asylums. Yet it is valuable for mental health professionals to know the evolution of treatment techniques, even ones based on outmoded theories. In this video, we will hear from two of psychiatry's thought leaders, both members of the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry, GAP. Oral history is essential if we are to understand where psychiatry came from, where it is now, and where it could be headed. The GAP 20th century videos are not intended to present a full accounting of complex medical and psychosocial issues. Rather, to introduce facts, concepts, and viewpoints that may be less well known or even forgotten today. In addition, the points of view expressed represent personal memories presented here without critical commentary. Our goal is to maintain continuity with the past as it informs the future. Dr. John Talbot, an expert in 20th century psychiatric institutions, discusses the importance of understanding the ebb and flow of psychiatric practice as it shapes today's decisions. He served as president of the American Psychiatric Association and vice president of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Dr. Talbot is editor-in-chief of the Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease and editor emeritus of Psychiatric Services. He is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Maryland and a GAP member on the Administration and Leadership Committee. I mean, I don't think most medical students today know about our history of lobotomies, leucotomies, lobectomies, uh, of psychosurgery of all sorts, of a water treatment, of cold packs, of hot treatment. Um, I don't think they have any idea how desperate we were uh, as a field, uh, injecting people with malaria, injecting people with insulin, uh, di dialyzing people to dialyze out whatever the toxic element was causing schizophrenia. Uh, we've had a, a, a history over a hundred years of, of what were called by Valenstein desperate cures. And um, I doubt if medical students know that. I don't think we talk that much about it. Um, we don't teach history much, uh, which, is, which is too bad and therefore we repeat it of course. Um, and, and this is nowhere more true than in PTSD, where since the Civil War, uh, Spanish-American War, First World War, Second World War, Korea, and Vietnam, we made the same mistakes every time, even though there's a vast literature that shows how to treat people who are getting stress disorders and how to prevent things, or at least forestall them, or prevent them to some extent from expressing themselves so fully. And we forget it every time around. Uh, we, we just don't learn from history. Some GAP members personally experienced the changing landscape of psychiatry. Dr. Donald Hammersley, who joined GAP in 1976, helped lead psychiatry into the modern era. After 10 years directing the APA's professional services and professional education projects. He became their deputy medical director from 1971 to 1988. In these roles, he steered decisions affecting issues such as accreditation standards for psychiatric facilities, improving insurance coverage for mental health care, and peer review and quality assurance criteria. Dr. Hammersley saw many psychiatric theories and treatments come and go. Throughout his career, he maintained focus on speaking for persons with serious mental disorders. In the following clips from interviews conducted by Dr. Donald Fiddler in 2006, 
He discusses a range of topics, institutional care, deinstitutionalization, outmoded treatments, advances in community care, and patient advocacy. Here, he recalls mid-century life for patients confined to asylums. Well, the small ones were a few hundred beds, and the large ones were several thousand beds. Some of them became super large, 10,000 and more beds. They became communities under themselves. The, the superintendent was like the mayor of a city. He uh, had to provide all the services that are necessary for living arrangements for people. Grounds of many state hospitals were beautifully landscaped. Once they had the patients there for long-term stays, needed something for the patients to do. And uh, in rural America, really that meant doing things like farming and gardening. Many of these patients who were chronically mentally ill were fine gardeners and farmers. And that's where they'd come from, and they were happiest when they were at their work. Butchered their own livestock to provide sources of meat, and raising your crops was a huge enterprise for uh, canning them and storing them for use uh, the rest of the year. A couple of problems with that. People pointed out that this was nothing more than indentured service, that you were making these people work for no pay. Much could be said for the therapeutic benefit of these nice grounds, because after all, the, the patients could enjoy them too once they were there. The uh, advocates for doing away with a natured service prevailed. This is no longer part of their enterprise. In the evolution in therapeutics, from the 19th to 20th centuries, somatic treatments blossomed alongside psychoanalysis. Hospital-based therapies administered in overcrowded and chaotic institutions, some containing over 10,000 patients, varied according to theory. Most treatments, however, were aimed at tranquilization rather than understanding patients. Hospitals changed, first of all, because the chemical controls these drugs exerted allowed hospitals to be predominantly open ward hospitals. It was no longer necessary to be predominantly closed or locked ward facilities. Before the availability of antipsychotic medications, such as chlorpromazine in the 1950s. Clinicians tried a number of approaches to reduce brain activity. One of the more benign interventions was hydrotherapy. Of course, therapeutic uses of water for healing are not a 20th century invention and were touted by ancient civilizations. Treatments varied from lavish spas to do-it-yourself immersions. Dr. Hammersley recalls the calming effect of water-based therapy in psychiatry. Uh, for overactive patients, they had hydrotherapy tied down in a tub or, or in, a, in a pack, a sheet pack. Now, would the water be cold water or hot water? Oh, uh, it would be tepid. Noisy, overactive patient. Uh, being forcefully restrained in this way, uh, got comfortable and usually quieted down and became tractable to uh, someone coming and actually talking with him uh, about uh, his illness or his family or in a way that was quite impossible when he was more aggressively incoherent. 
The first half of the 20th century witnessed newer somatic therapies based on disparate theories. The organism causing syphilis was discovered in 1905. Treponema pallidum could be killed by raising body temperature, as observed in individuals with malarial fevers. The 1927 Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded to Julius Wagner Jareg of Austria for the use of induced malaria to treat syphilis. In the 1930s, Ladislas Maduna of Hungary observed that the brains of persons with epilepsy had increased gliosis, whereas those with schizophrenia reduced. Perhaps the two illnesses were antagonistic, and inducing seizures with pentaline tetrazole in those with schizophrenia would help them. Less violent seizures could be induced by electrical current. After some success, electrical current replaced chemicals, and electroconvulsive therapy flourished. Dr. Hammersley notes successes and problems. The early 1940s, as a medical student, I used to work to make a little extra money in a, a psychiatric unit in Omaha, Nebraska, with a doctor by the name of A.E. Bennett, mainly treating severe depression with uh, electroshock treatment. Within a course of eight or ten treatments given over a three-week period, he would achieve a recovery from depression almost uniformly and magically. It gave me the impression as a, as a just entering the field that uh, this was, you know, an absolutely marvelous treatment that was uh, a magical cure. I expect a lot of people were impressed that way and it probably resulted in overuse of electroshock treatment to all kinds of conditions. And where this was rather specific for depression, it was not a good treatment for many other conditions of schizophrenia and anxieties and so forth, which resulted in its overuse, which resulted in a lot of criticism, and protest about use of electroshock treatment, and causing it probably not be used when it would have been useful. Uh, I've seen people who have to go through a long period of drug trials because it was the law that these drugs had to be used first before they could use electroshock treatment. And it meant several months of agony for these people when they finally got the electroshock treatment, in two weeks they were back to uh, good function again. Mid-century somatic treatments, in addition to the revolution in tranquilizers, included insulin-induced coma and psychosurgery. The induction of coma by insulin was pioneered by Austrian Manfred Zackel between 1928 and 1933. After repeated comas, a dangerous procedure, some patients with schizophrenia improved, though there was no apparent explanation based on theory. In 1938, a popular magazine profiled Dr. Zockel and his controversial therapy. By contrast, psychosurgery was driven by an understanding of correlative neuroanatomy. In the 21st century, insulin coma is no longer discussed, and therapeutic psychosurgery is greatly reduced. Dr. Hammersley recalls the risks and benefits of insulin coma for schizophrenia. Well, I, I had a little involvement with uh, insulin coma therapy. It was the best treatment we had, I think, at, in World War II and uh, for uh, acute schizophrenia. It seemed to help uh, get the patient over the acute phase and uh, and uh, oftentimes uh, achieved recovery. The, the um, patient would be given a, a standard dose of insulin 
by injection. Insulin in, in uh, subcoma dosage often uh, calmed one down and uh, was, was comfortable. If you increase the dosage, uh, you eventually got to a level that uh, induced a coma. The deeper the coma, the greater the hazard to the patient's welfare. One could get into an irreversible coma virtually and uh, uh, the heart would stop and you'd die. So your margin of safety wasn't great when you were doing insulin coma therapy. You had to be ready with a glucose solution to immediately correct the effect of the insulin on the body. How, how long would the people be in the uh, coma traditionally? Uh, it typically ran over a morning's time of two or three hours, and it gradually going into the coma and then staying in a deep coma a uh, better part of an hour. What, what were the uh, side effects or the mental status like of a person after that coma? He was calmer, and uh, the intensity of his his disordered thinking would fade over a period of, of a few weeks that he was receiving treatment. Why uh, it was possible to have a pretty complete remission uh, of the psychotic symptoms. Psychosurgery, popularized by Egas Moniz of Portugal, led to a Nobel Prize in 1949. The best known procedure was prefrontal lobotomy, or leucotomy, which alleviated psychotic symptoms but often left apathy as a side effect. Its popularity was promoted in America by surgeons William Freeman and James Watts. The rise of antipsychotic medications from the 1950s through the 1970s, however, rendered surgery unnecessary. While the widespread use of lobotomy has been discredited in the 21st century, more specific procedures remain for intractable obsessive-compulsive disorder. Deep brain stimulation has also replaced ablative procedures. The use of, of lobotomy in the uh, 40s and 50s was uh, an active treatment, uh, in some places at least, uh, and was probably overused in, in many cases, and its justification would be uh, partly uh, the lack of other efficacious treatment. Uh, taking a swipe with a knife through the frontal lobes of a person disrupted the connections between the thought and feeling that a person was experiencing. And so the indications for prefrontal lobotomy were? Prolonged, uh, intense symptoms usually of, of, of psychosis or overwhelming anxiety. And what were the patients like after they had had a prefrontal lobotomy? Well, they tended to be emotionless, sometimes with good work skills still in, in types of jobs that uh, were routine and uh, repetitive. In the months I spent as a resident looking at uh, taking care of patients uh, post lobotomy, period six months or so after lobotomy, I saw very few impressive results in a positive way. Uh, some people, to be sure, were, were relieved of painful symptoms. There was not a kind of recovery that you hoped for of a person returning to uh, his old self. What, what would families say about their family members who had had the prefrontal lobotomies? Some of them were happy to see the relief it gave their mm -hmm. patients. Others were extremely disappointed that it didn't 
quote, cure them, uh, return them to uh, the person they had known. How long would it take somebody after a prefrontal lobotomy to medically recover? Rather short time, I think, if, if there were no complications. Uh, a matter of, of a few weeks. Meanwhile, in the years following World War II, there was a shift in the patient population. Many veterans needed mental health care, and there was little infrastructure to care for them or for citizens emerging from institutions. GAP, founded in 1946 under the leadership of Dr. Will Menninger, sought to upgrade psychiatry on par with other medical specialties. Well, I believe it was a group of, of psychiatrists coming out off of duty in, in World War II that saw the possibilities of a much more uh, active and effective use of psychiatry in uh, the care of the mentally ill in the country and the appreciation of World War II veterans who were at levels of what we would call PTSD today. Will Menninger had been head of psychiatry in the uh, Surgeon General's office in World War II the Department of Defense, and he had recruited some helpers, such as Walter Barton and Bill Bloomberg, and that were sort of the leadership group of psychiatrists coming out. They uh, took an activist role in getting this organization started, and it caught on as a very useful voice of psychiatry in a much more active way than uh, APA ever had. They had only a minor voice in a rather stodgy journal of the American Psychiatric Association. So there was a competitive edge between the two organizations. It was a significant help in, in uh, activating the, the APA. The leadership in GAP became leadership in APA. And so the two have moved along in concert over the years in relative harmony. Dr. Hammersley recalls that the American Psychiatric Association showed leadership through its first medical director, Daniel Blaine, in the 1940s and 1950s. Dr. Blaine was born in China to missionary parents and moved to America at 13. He advocated for patient care prior to a robust consumer advocacy movement. A founding member of GAP, Dr. Blaine was APA president in 1964 and 1965. During World War II, there had been a buildup of neglect in public mental hospitals. Uh, after World War II, with the, the help of certain writers uh, exposing conditions, there was an enthusiasm to uh, now that the war was over, we could ought to clean up this shame of the states, as it was called. Much was done in the terms of new construction and new uh, enthusiasm, new staffing. I think they have, uh, used to be standing rather alone as an advocate for the mentally ill. What we've seen happen over uh, the last 50 years is that increasing complexity of advocacy groups that want to do right by the mentally ill. The EA ha has, has strong links with NAMI and uh, the NAMH. And it's resulted rather complex cooperation between these organizations. So realizing uh, APA as well as these other that they can't do it by themselves, but they multiply their strength by doing it together. How 
was the movement from asylum to community accomplished? From Dr. Hammersley's point of view, first-generation antipsychotic medications had the greatest impact in permitting institutionalized patients to live in the community. This movement was not without its detractors. Those of us that were thinking about deinstitutionalization is a good thing, and uh, it will be successful if you take the money that you were spending locking people up, use it instead for community support to these patients out in the community. They say, uh, you know, history has a way of repeating itself. There is a kind of neglect among the homeless, mentally ill on the streets of the country. Not unlike Dorothy Dix described, we built these huge state hospitals to get these people into humane care. And then this fell into disrepute and we've been through a phase now of, of tearing down most of our old state hospitals. We've tried to create a system of community care that's uh, proved to be faulty in many respects. The funding doesn't come through where it's needed. The economics of the situation, of psychiatrists are going to go where they can make a good living, They're the best living they can, and it sure isn't in the public institutions. Psychiatrists in public institutions have not been a part of the mainstream of psychiatry in recent generations. Many of them are no longer run by psychiatrists. Psychiatrists play a little or no part in them. So I'd, I'd like to see that uh, us come back around it and start looking at the ways to correct the neglect that we can see today in our prisons and in our homeless uh, uh, streets. Deinstitutionalization was inevitable, given the high cost of hospital care and the rights of citizens to live freely. But, as Dr. Hammersley explains, it can only work if community-based care is adequately funded and not confounded by politics. We, we encouraged the institutionalization on the assumption that the dollar would follow the patient out in the community. But too often politicians saw it differently, it saw it as attractive from the standpoint of saving money. From that it was only a little step to these people can go home as long as they take their drugs and we'll follow them up in the community. Well, that system worked pretty well as long as they weren't lost in the community and, uh, and separated from the follow-up resources that were intended to provide them with the stability that they uh, needed. We learned a lot about humanizing care and uh, developing concepts of therapeutic community in which the patients indeed participated in their own treatment planning. We're not simply objects that were uh, given treatment, but rather in which they were participating as fully as the professional staff that were working with them. But many schiz uh, schizophrenic illnesses were going to be long-term deals. While we weren't going to cure them, there was a lot that we could do to stabilize them and make them happy and productive people. And some of this certainly involved not acute medical care or, or medication, but uh, good programs of rehabilitation and training in uh, activities of daily living or occupational skills that they were quite capable of learning and uh, taking on uh, and that would allow them to become self-sufficient individuals in the community.
With the shift of psychiatric patients into the community, there was a need for new approaches to mental health. Prominent among them was the use of short-term, community-based hospitalization coupled with outpatient follow-up. The average veteran that checked into the hospital where I was a resident would would expect to stay anywhere from several weeks to several months or, or several years indefinitely. I was in charge of a short-term stay unit that indeed took patients for two weeks and that was considered remarkably short-term. In most hospitals today, uh, a two-week length of stay would be considered a, a cause for alarm. A robust public health approach to community psychiatric care must include government support. Dr. Hammersley recalls his testimony to the House Ways and Means Committee in support of Indian Health Service programs. In later years, I was testifying in support of uh, Indian Health Services, in support of, of sufficient money to buy the professional staff that were needed on the reservations in an Indian institution. Get programs started, Congress bought into attacking the problems of fetal alcohol syndrome and uh, fetal alcohol effects. If a young uh, Native American girl uh, had a fetal alcohol damaged baby in her first pregnancy, and she was living in a social setting where alcohol ran freely in her family members and so forth. It was almost a hundred percent assurance that if she got pregnant again, she would have another fetal alcohol damaged baby. We could recommend in, in our testimony to Congress that some kind of safe house systems could uh, develop that could take these girls out of their alcohol sodden uh, social setting and protect them during their pregnancy and they could have a normal child. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, it led to the uh, wisdom of labeling alcohol, not just Indians, but all people, that there was a danger of the use of alcohol in pregnant women. In mid-20th century, while psychoanalytic theory had become a basis for understanding the human mind, psychoanalysis was out of reach for most Americans, let alone those with serious mental illness. Instead, the use of supportive and psychoeducational approaches predominated. Custodial care would be replaced by autonomy. Well, I, I started training at a time, at a time and place where uh, psychoanalysis was uh, the bedrock of learning good psychotherapy. Having a psychoanalytic understanding of human behavior was, was great. Uh, it was not enough in terms of the magnitude of the problem that we were faced with the uh, uh, mentally ill of the country. The importance of being mindful of psychiatry's past cannot be overemphasized. Today's leaders know that psychiatry can evolve only with the support of professional organizations, consumers, and government. Following Dr. Hammersley's example, GAP will continue to provide guidance and leadership in the 21st century. <laughs>